The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in the filling of the spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. So we're moving on now. We've had a few days of review so that we could catch some people up. But now we're at Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. After he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Large crowds followed him at this point because he was teaching doctrine. Remember, before that point, he had performed a lot of miracles. And a lot of people were following Jesus around just to see a miracle. But when he got up on the mountain, he stopped performing miracles. And on the mountain, he simply taught doctrine. And he was teaching his disciples. And disciple, by the way, is student. It means you're a student of the Word of God. So he was teaching to the students of the Word of God. And there weren't just 12 disciples. There were many, many, many disciples. And we see this from the large crowd. Now, there were a few chosen ones who would later become apostles. And that was uh, determined in eternity past because he knew they uh, would have a certain spiritual gift and fulfill it and function under it. So a lot of people were listening to our Lord when he was on the mountain. So large crowds followed him because they were interested in the word of God. Before that, they were a lot of the people were interested in miracles, and once he stopped performing miracles, they went on their merry way. Chapter 8, verse 2. And a leper approached. Now, this is a Jewish leper. And how do I know it's a Jewish leper? Because of the command he gives to this leper. He wouldn't give this command to a Gentile leper. So, a Jewish leper approached and bowed low before him, recognition of the authority of the Son of God, saying, Lord, you are able to cleanse me if you are willing. So him proclaiming Christ as Lord indicated that this was a result of this Jew's positive volition, positive volition as an unbeliever. And then he said, I believe that he is the Son of God. And when he believed that, as a result of that, he knew that Jesus Christ could heal him of his leprosy. So this is an indication that this Jew had definitely believed in Christ, unlike most of the other Jews. So as a result, knowing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he knew that the Lord would be willing to heal him. Chapter 8, verse 3. He reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. The immediate result was the leper being cleansed. No doubt that this was a, a shocking sight to behold and even more shocking for the leper himself. Now Jesus healed at these times to demonstrate that he was, in fact, the Messiah. It wasn't simply Jesus Christ's ministry to go around and heal everyone. You know, there were a lot of sick people in the area. There always are sick people. And he didn't go around and heal every person who was sick. He healed a few, most of whom who came to him and said, Look, I need help. And all of those who came and said, Look, I need help, were believers because they already knew he was the Son of God and they knew that he could help him. Secondly, this was a way to prove from uh, the Old Testament scriptures that he was the Messiah. 
that the Messiah would come and heal the afflicted. Chapter 8, verse 4. Then Jesus said to him, See that you do not speak to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. This shows that he was a Jew. This shows that he would be functioning still under the Mosaic law because even though this is the dispensation of the hypostatic union, the people are still functioning under the laws of Israel because Israel is still, even though under the fourth cycle of discipline, they are still a client nation to God and they still must follow the Mosaic law. So first of all, he says uh, to go and uh, uh, tell the priest about it. Don't tell anyone else. So this was Jesus announcement to the priesthood that he had arrived. You see, uh, before that time, the priest, well, leprosy is an incurable disease. And if you were a leper, you could not present yourself before the priest because, well, you had to follow certain conditions. You, you had to be without spot or blemish. And in fact, a teenager who has pimples would not be able to present themselves to the priest. They have blemishes. And someone with leprosy, they're put on a leprosy list. And they are, of course, ostracized by society. And no one should have contact with a leper. It was part of their health code. And it was a good health code. There was nothing wrong with it. In the same way, we should uh, probably follow health codes more strictly. But this is all part of the Mosaic Law. And this was a health code. And so, what he's saying here is, look, you go to the priesthood and you tell the priests that, that you've been healed. Well, what this is going to indicate to those priests is that the Messiah has arrived. Because they know all the Old Testament scripture. And they know that the Messiah will heal people. You see, they're knowledgeable in the Old Testament. And so they would be able to think to themselves, well, this guy's just been healed of leprosy, and they'll know it because he'll be on the leper's list. They kept a list of every leper, and they would bring out his name. What's your name, son? And he would say his name. And they would look on the list, and he would be on the list of the lepers. And then they would say to him, uh, well, you've been healed. and Nobody's ever been healed. And then they would have to go back into Scripture and see what they would have to do when someone was healed with leprosy. It happened very rarely. It did happen occasionally in the Old Testament. And the fact that it's happening now after so many hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, the fact that this guy has been healed from leprosy, well, it should have shocked them. It should have made them uh, t take a look at this man called Jesus Christ and see and start to look from Scripture and say, you know, he probably is the Messiah. So this is why he said, go to the priest. Now he said, don't go and tell everyone. Now why'd he do that? You would think, you know what he did though. As soon as he was healed, he probably ran down the street and, hallelujah, I'm healed. Jesus has healed me. And it would be a natural reaction. Any of us would do that. Just run up, I'm healed from leprosy. Leprosy was a crippling, crippling disease. A terrible disease. It actually rots your flesh. And suddenly it's gone. So he had been in an extraordinary pain. It's painful too. For a long time. And now he has no pain. The pain's gone. And the leprosy's gone. He's excited. So the first thing he's going to want to do is run out and tell the whole world that Jesus Christ had healed him. But what does Jesus say to him? And why would Jesus say this? Why would he say, nah, keep it on the down low right now? Why would he do that? Why would he say, don't tell anyone? Because when you are a brand new believer, you do not have the capability to witness. You don't have enough information to witness. You don't know enough about it. Well, you're saved yourself because you're a new believer. But you don't know enough about it to run around and tell everybody about Jesus because you'll be confused because you're so excited and emotional and so will uh, the other people who hear you and they will be more impressed with the miracle than the fact that he is the Son of God. So he tells him, look, you go to the priest, go to the people who've been studying the word from the Mosaic Law and they should be able to recognize it. They didn't, of course, they should have been able to, but they did not recognize this at all. 
and, and not because they hadn't studied, just because they did not, they weren't positive toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. Chapter 8, verse 4. And that's what we just went over. Chapter 8, verse 5. When he came into Capernaum, Capernaum, a Roman centurion came to him asking for help. Now this would be something that the Jews would see as very strange. You see, we must interpret the scripture from the time in which it was written. And the Roman centurion was always a, well, it was, he was a force. He was an authority over the Jews. And most of the Jews despised the centurions just as they despised tax collectors. Because the centurions had great authority over all the people because Israel, remember, is under the fourth cycle of discipline. And they can do nothing about it because they haven't responded to Christ's message, and they won't. And so this centurion, a man of authority, a man probably, just as if we were to see, if uh, back in the olden days it would be more important than we seem to see it today, but a man with five stars on his uh, shoulder, a five-star general, walking up to a Jew. Jesus Christ was a Jew. A man who is supposed to be under the authority of the Romans, and he does function under their authority. Pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. So Jesus paid taxes to the Roman Empire, and he did not feel bitter about it like most of the other Jews. But uh, this five-star general, a hated man, a, uh, it's a symbol of the authority of Rome over Israel walks up to Jesus, a Jew, and says, I need help. Now that shocked everybody, especially the Jews. This Roman, this person's always been over authority over us, and most, uh, in doubt, no, most, uh, most definitely many of those soldiers were probably very abusive to the Jews. Well, they have a sin nature, and usually someone in power with a sin nature is going to abuse it. So he would abuse the power, beat up the Jews and all that. So when they see this centurion, it's a shock. And then he's not only just coming to Jesus, but he's coming to Jesus saying, look, I need help. A Roman soldier saying, I need help. So this shows that Jesus Christ is actually going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. And remember in the Abrahamic covenant, it says from the seed of Abraham... All nations will be blessed, including the Roman Empire, including the United States of America, including all and all the nations who believe in Christ. The blessing goes to them. Then in chapter 8, verse 6, then this, uh, this centurion says this, and uh, this will shock the Jews. You see, the Jews, let me frame it for you before we continue. The Jews always thought of themselves as superior. They thought of themselves as a superior race. They thought of themselves as having a superior spiritual life. They thought of themselves that way because they were the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they claimed it. Just, by, just from birthright they claimed it. But that's not the way it works, and we know that. It's faith alone in Christ alone, not primogeniture. Not, not because you're just born a Jew doesn't mean you're saved. But all the Jews walked around very piously and very holy, saying, uh, we are better than everyone else around us, than the Romans especially. They despise the Romans and the Greeks. And we are much better than all of these people because Abraham is our father. Now this centurion comes up to our Lord and says this, Lord, well, he's a believer. He recognizes Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Lord, my son is lying at home paralyzed in terrible anguish. He's in a lot of pain. Then Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And he'd been doing it all day long anyway. So the Roman soldier comes up. It shows that uh, he has no discrimination against the races. And he has no discrimination against the Roman centurion. And he says, all right, I'll heal. I'll come. He says, I will come and heal him. Meaning uh, he was willing to drop everything and go to the Roman centurion's house, which would really be comparable to almost a palace. The centurions had a very uh, fine living quarters, very plush living quarters, and they had servants, 
And they really, all they had to do if they wanted to have a drink, they could say, uh, go get me something to drink. Or if they want to eat, go get me something to eat. And people would bring it to them. They were high ranking like a five-star general would be. And if you're in the army and a five-star general says, a tin hut, you go to attention. So everything he said, everyone obeyed him. 8-8. Eight, eight. But the centurion replied, Lord. See, he is noticing the deity of Christ, the fact that he is the son of God. Something that Judas Iscariot never did. Every time you find Judas Iscariot in Matthew, he says, teacher, rabbi. And that's really an insult because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not just a teacher. He's not a rabbi. Those rabbis were self-righteous hypocrites. And he is above a rabbi. But this centurion recognizes the Lord by saying, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Now we have to understand the meaning of this. And it's not that the Roman uh, wasn't uh, worthy. The Roman centurion, uh, for all indications, understood grace. And he understood that he was made worthy by faith alone in Christ alone. So he's not saying that I'm not worthy for you, Lord, because all of us are worthy by faith alone in Christ alone. What he's saying is, my plush headquarters, the place where I reside, you're the son of God. You're not even, I'm not worthy to have you come into my plush house. That's what he's saying. You see, Jesus Christ, he understood deity. He understood that in eternity past, Jesus Christ resided in heaven. And so the centurion is saying, look, I'm not worthy to have you come into my pitiful little home, which wasn't little and wasn't pitiful. It was a grand home with servants and maidservants and people hustling around, always doing his bidding. Yet he said, no, it's not good enough for you, Lord. It's not good enough for you, the Son of God. That's what he's saying. Instead, just speak the word, and my little son will be healed. Just speak the word. This is showing and indicating a phenomenal use of the faith rest drill. Well, he had so much faith. Well, he looked at Jesus Christ and said, Wow, there's the Son of God. I know he can heal my son. So he goes to the Son of God, heal my son. The Son of God says, all right, I'll come heal your son. He says, no, my place isn't worthy enough for you. I'm not worthy enough for you to come under the roof of my palace. So just heal him now. You can do it. So he had enough faith. So he used the faith rest drill. And he is saying, and if this indicates something about him, uh, he might not yet be spiritually mature, but he's on the road to spiritual maturity. He has the right mental attitude and his mental attitude is I listen to the word of God I believe Jesus Christ is my savior and he had probably been as a centurion following our Lord around listening to him he was probably scripture doesn't say this but the fact that he knows so much doctrine indicates that he was probably up there on the mountain with them all as a centurion at five-star general they can do what they want so he's up there listening to Jesus Somebody says, oh, somebody in authority over him says, what you're doing? He says, I'm managing these crowds. That's all he would have to say, and they'd leave him alone. So he could hang around Jesus all the time. And he probably did, and he learned a lot of doctrine, more than the Israelites, more than the disciples standing beside him. So let's see here. 8, 9, for I too am a man under authority. I too am a man under authority. I have, as you see, he's under authority. He has uh, commanders over him. And all of us, by the way, are under authority. And we must always in life come to an authority orientation, something that this man had. And if you don't have authority orientation, you'll never get with the word of God. You always have strife. You must understand what authority is. And you must, uh, well, if you don't agree with it, keep your mouth shut. And that is the point of authority. And he knows how to deal with it. That's why he's so successful. For I, too, am a man under authority. And then he goes on to say that he is also in authority over others. I have soldiers under me. And probably this guy would be a wonderful man to have in authority because he would be flexible. He would be all of those things that you would want from a general. 
and you could go up and talk to him personally and he would talk to you and he would be very flexible in his life because he was under authority too. He knows how it feels to be under authority. I have soldiers under me and I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. And of course, he probably had many slaves. Slavery was uh, permitted in the Roman Empire up until a point. Then they got wise and said, no one should be anyone else's property. And that has come down into our Judeo-Christian ethic, also from uh, Philemon, and those things, that slavery is actually a social evil. It's something that the Word of God really does not permit. But it does say if you are under slavery, remain that way. Remain under authority. Don't bulk authority. In other words, I am not going to treat the Son of God like my slave. This is what the centurion is saying. I tell everybody around me, do this and do that, and they do it. I'm not about to tell the Son of God to come to my house and to just heal somebody, and I'm not going to make you go anywhere. I'm not going to make you do a thing. You can do it right here. You're the Son of God. It's a man of great faith. A man of tremendous faith, a man with the right mental attitude concerning the Word of God. 8.10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Well, he was pleased. He was encouraged. Everybody needs a little encouragement now and then, especially a communicator of doctrine. And Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, communicated doctrine. And he was very encouraged by this centurion. He was very happy that this centurion uh, came up and demonstrated such great faith. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Now, when you amaze the Lord Jesus Christ, you're doing something. This indicates this man uh, most definitely was in spiritual maturity. When you amaze the Lord Jesus Christ, you're doing something that's phenomenal. And notice the humility of this man. It takes humility to grow in grace. You cannot grow in grace and be arrogant. You cannot grow in grace and try to overthrow the system of authority that I didn't put in place, but that God put in place in eternity past. God put the pastor in authority over the congregation. You are described as sheep. Pastors have sticks, you know? And they beat the people when they're out of line and say, all right, you're getting out of line this week. Bap, bap, bap. Back into the fold you go. Now, the only difference is the sheep then would go bah, and go back into the fold. But with human beings, you can go bap, 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 and they go bah, and out the door. But that's their choice, see. It's freedom. And freedom is a wonderful thing. It's not something to be demeaned. And if somebody wants to go and hear someone who is very sweet with great platitudes, I don't have a problem with that. They won't learn anything, and I feel sorry for them, but I, I can't change my, the way I'm doing it. For I, too, am a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. In other words, the Son of God, I am not going to tell the Son of God what to do. He is my authority. You just do it right now, and I'll go on my way, is what he's saying. Great respect for the Son of God, as he should be given great respect. 8.11. Then, uh, well, 8.10. Let's continue with 8.10, the second half of it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who followed him. Who followed him? All the students he had been teaching for years he had been teaching these disciples well, for at least, uh, at least a year, maybe just a little less than a year, and he had been teaching these people, and they had been listening. And up comes a centurion, probably somebody the, the Jews had never seen before. They might have recognized him and just said, uh, there's a man whom I hate in authority. But suddenly, uh, Jesus Christ comes into contact with this man, and he was amazed by this man, and he says, I tell you the truth, I have not found faith like this in anyone in Israel. What'd he do? 
He called this centurion out of the crowd. He noticed something about the mental attitude of the centurion. And he pointed at the centurion. And he said, you have greater faith than all these students who have been following me for six months. And he pointed it out and he made it personal. Why? Because he wanted the disciples to wake up. He wanted them to know it's time to get with the word of God. He wanted them to know, look, this Gentile, this Roman Gentile has more faith than you, Peter, than you, disciples. It was an encouragement for the Lord, and he was excited. So he pointed the man out of the crowd, and he made an illustration, a comparison, and a contrast. And from that comparison and contrast, he, as it were, took a hot thing and rammed it into the butts of the disciples and said, Get with it! You're Jews! You've known this for a long time. You've known me as the Son of God for a long time. And this centurion comes out of the blue with more faith than you have. Insulting, wasn't it? Oh, they were offended, but they stuck with our Lord, of course. They weren't going to say, Ooh, No, how dare he, and run out the door. They were offended. Look, Jesus Christ, all through his ministry, offended a lot of people. Why else did he hang on the cross? But he had to get his point across. And he got his point across right here with the centurion by pointing him out of a crowd. Look, this man knows more than all the people in Israel. And the people, the people around him, instead of getting insulted, they should have shivered in their boots. They should have said to themselves, oh my, the fifth cycle is coming. You mean this Gentile, not part of a client nation, is doing better than we are? We need to get with it. Our country's about to go under. That's what they should have thought. And later on, they got with it. They grew up, but they needed a kick in the butt. If Jesus had uh, not said these things, they wouldn't have realized that they did need a kick in the butt. But they realized it. And they said to themselves, later on, they might have offended him right then at the second, but later on they said, yeah, you're right. I need to get with it. And so Peter and all the other disciples around him got with the word of God, and they stuck with him. And they stuck with it day after day after day. And we'll see how Jesus Christ in a moment would just go up to somebody who knew that he was the Son of God and say, come, follow me. And they would drop everything and follow him. And they would have a successful business going. And they would be working with their father or something else who had a successful business going. And they wouldn't even go get their clothes. They just, all right, I'll follow you, Lord. So 8.12, well, 8.11, I tell you for your benefit, many will come from the east. The east would be all the way out to India and China. And there have been people in India and China who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you for your benefit, many will come from the east, India. Now this was shocking to the Jews as well. They always thought of themselves as special. And now he's saying, look, This centurion is doing better than you are. Now get with it, because I'm telling you the truth. People will come from the east, India, and people will come from the west, all the way beyond Spain, which would include the United States today, and they will come to believe in me. And he's saying what he's doing, he's foreshadowing the fact that Israel's about to fall on their face because of their negative volition, because they don't care about it. 8.13, then Jesus said, well, 8.12, I keep skipping around. I tell you for your benefit, many will come from the east to India and west beyond Spain, even from the United States, to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all Jews. And Jesus is saying, look, everyone is going to have a part in this. Everyone is going to believe in me. And you think you're so special. There are going to be people from the east. And there's going to be people from the west. And there's going to be people in 2005 in the United States of America in Anderson sitting down and listening to the word of God. 
and they're going to have greater faith than you, disciples. That's what he's saying. Insulting. But they needed it. Everybody needs a good kick in the butt, don't you think? I do. I always have needed one. Because uh, uh, if I never got a kick in the butt, I would have never grown up spiritually. And the Lord uh, sends testings, and he sends all types of things so that we can grow up. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing. And what I try to do from the pulpit is not be mean. I'm not being mean. That's the worst thing in the world. I'm trying to communicate something. If I don't do it well, well, give me a chance. Have a little grace about, about you and say, well, all right, that's fine. Give him a chance. Let him grow up a little. Maybe he'll get better later. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. But uh, I'm the authority. And that's the point. So 8.13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go about your business. Well, I, I skipped it again. I could kick myself in the butt right now. 8.12, <laughs> but the sons of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom, those are the religious but unregenerate Jews who have heard the gospel. All of these people had heard the gospel, and they are the sons of the kingdom simply by primogeniture, simply by being the children of Abraham, will be thrown out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, there are unbelieving Jews there. There are unbelieving self-righteous Jews there. And he says something to them. Well, he just insulted his closest students. Now he's about to insult those unbelievers. But it's not an insult in bitterness. It's something to try to shock them, to wake them up, so they can say, ooh, I do need to change my mind. But the sons of the kingdom, religious but unregenerate Jews who have heard the gospel, will be thrown out into outer darkness. You will be thrown out into outer darkness. You see, the centurion's still there. And he says, I've never seen such great faith like this. You don't have faith like this, my students. And you, unregenerate Jews, you will be thrown into outer darkness. Now tell me, is that mean? No, it's not mean. He was telling them the truth, and they did not like that at all. Of course not. Who would? But it's the word of God. He had to make it clear. If he had not made it clear, he wouldn't have been doing his job. If he hadn't made it clear, some of those people may not have believed. And some of them did because he made it so clear. And he shocked them. Well, I mean, just think about it. He's healing people everywhere, and then he's just going, You there! You're all unregenerate, and you're going to be thrown into outer darkness. Then he goes on, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You there, all of you in front, you see he's talking to an audience. He's not talking to himself. And there's people in front of him. And he's saying, look, you're going to go to a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look at this centurion. He's believed in me and has greater faith than my disciples. And all of you unregenerate people, you're all going to hell unless you believe in me. And of course he gave the gospel, and Matthew may have not recorded it because he was more impressed with the shock value of things. He was impressed with that because Matthew all his life had been nitpicked on by all the religious crowd his whole life. Why? Because he was a tax collector, and they looked down their noses at tax collectors. So everywhere he went, he was spat upon. They would spit on him because he was a representative of the Roman Empire in which the Roman Empire had authority over the Jews and they hated authority. So they would spit on him and they hated Matthew. And so when Jesus would get up and say, you unregenerate, you're all going to hell. Well, he lit up and said, I'm writing that down. I've never heard this before. It's about dang time somebody told them what they were all about. And that's what he was thinking, enthused, enthused with the word of God, enthused with the, well, the harshness of it, not, not because it's harsh, but because it brings out a point. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his, uh, look at me, then Jesus said to the centurion, go about your business. 
In other words, he's doing the right thing. He has exhibited great humility in coming to the Lord as a Roman centurion with a great amount of authority. And he's presented a lot of humility in submitting to the authority of Christ. And, he is, and then Christ uh, looks at the centurion after chewing everyone out. And you see, the centurion has got to be smiling by now. I mean, the Lord just said, well, I've never seen anything like this before. You're the greatest thing I've seen since I've been teaching. Well, of course the centurion's going to say, yeah. And guess what? He'll probably stick with the ministry, the ministry of Christ, that is. And he probably remained a mature believer, growing in grace and in knowledge like all of us should. But he was enthused about it. And he used him as a point of reference, saying, look at this person. And insulted. He made it personal very personal, especially for the disciples who had been around him his whole, the, for a long time by now. And the, the funny thing is, we'll see as we keep going through Matthew, is that Jesus insulted the disciples time after time after time again. But time after time after time again, they remained with Jesus. Well, they needed it, and they were humble enough to say to themselves, yeah, that was good. You see, I, I got a lot of mixed messages about last night's message, and I'm not making it personal, no more than Jesus would. But uh, after the message last night, my wife came up to me and said, Man, that was a good message. And then I wake up and get all kinds of mixed results from that one. Was it good or bad? I don't know. It was either really good or really terrible, one or the other, from what I hear. But Jesus Christ was tough. You have to be tough. You can't be soft. And the, the reason why you have to be tough is it, it weeds out people who are interested and people who are not. So think, think to yourself, why are you here and why aren't others? Well, they're busy doing something. Okay, fine. But think to yourself, I mean, don't judge other people, but I'm talking about you and the whole city of Anderson. Why are you here and the whole city of Anderson doing something else? And don't think about anyone else. That's not my point ever. I'm talking in general, the whole place, the whole country's going to hell. I mean, come on. So we have a few people here. Why are you here? Because you're interested in it. And if you're insulted, you take it and you say, well, maybe you're right. And if I'm wrong, well, at least you can have enough grace to say, well, I'll keep going with this son of a bitch anyway. <laughs> That's what I did with my pastor. He chewed the, you don't even know. If you were there, uh, you would have wept for me. <laughs> you see, the power went out. And I was probably sitting right there where my dad is. And I, well, it's my fault. I stopped paying attention because it was something I'd heard before, but I should have been paying attention anyway. And he was talking about inviting Christ into your heart and how that's wrong. Well, my eyes glazed over because, of course, I had heard that about to 700 or 1,500, 3,000 times before that. But it's good to have repetition. I was there. I should have paid attention. But my eyes glazed over, and in fact, I was looking at his shiny bald head because he had a very, very shiny bald head. And I stared at it. And all of a sudden, he was doing something over here. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and went, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what he was saying. I was scared. Yeah. I was sweating. So then I said, Woo, I need to act relaxed or something. What's going on? And then I thought, this man is psychotic. <laughs> but then after the message, I got in my car and we're driving back home. And we need to hear our daily tape anyway. And my dad says, all right, well, let's hear the colonel, even though he is a son of a bitch. <laughs> well, that's grace. That's grace orientation. And if you have enough humility, you can do it. And I still listen to the man today. And something about my face irritated him because every time after that point I sat down in front of him, there wasn't a time I didn't get spit on except at Baraka because he was sitting too far away to spit on me. He was way up in the thing, and you know, it's a large congregation. But I would always sit in the front anyway. I was glutton for punishment. I said, well, let me go get my butt chewed out again, walk in, sit down, and the, sure enough, it would happen. He even made a comment about my wife's high heels. Isn't that insensitive? <laughs>
Well, for some people it would be, but you see, you can't be hypersensitive when it comes to the Word of God. And his personality was harsher than mine. And if I imitate him, well, good, because he's the best pastor that's ever been. But I do have my own personality, and all of you know that who have listened to me and have listened to the colonel. Now, I've been accused from that, not by people here. I'm not talking about anyone here. On the Internet, you see, I get feedback on the Internet because this congregation is a bit larger than the one here, maybe about the same size or a little larger. And they listen. And I get feedback sometimes, and they, they nitpick this, that, and the other. And sometimes I bring it up as an illustration to say, look, relax. It's not directed necessarily toward anyone here, but if it hurts you, well, maybe there's you protesteth too much. You see, when people protest a lot, it's because it has hurt them. And I had no intention to hurt anyone's feelings. But you see, feelings isn't part of the spiritual life anyway. Because I guarantee you this, if you were to reject this ministry because of personality, you would be rejecting the greatest thing. And I don't say this in arrogance. I say it from a position of spiritual self-esteem and knowing what's out there. I know there's not a church out there like this one in South Carolina. I know there's other doctrinal pastors. But right here, if you want face-to-face, -face, this is the only place you're going to get it. Now, if there's one out there that I'm unaware of, then great. The more, the merrier to me. I mean, let's get this country out of the, out of the slump. I'm not here for competition. I'm not here to do anything but teach the Word of God. I'm concerned about your souls. I'm concerned about the, the country. I, I don't want to be 40 years old and watch young people being slaughtered in a war. I don't want to do that. It's that serious. And I get emotional because I have to. Because that's the dead end. I love my country. And I love all of you and I don't want all of you to grow. So 8, uh, 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go about your business. Go about your business. You're doing what's right. You're listening to the word of God. Go about your business. Just as you believed. He believed the Lord. It is done for you. So he was healed right then. Boom. His son was healed. The centurion knew it, and he didn't even worry about it. He probably didn't even run home to his son. He probably went out on some assignment. It doesn't say that, but I'm just having conjecture here. Because he knew it. He knew it. his son was healed. So he just did whatever. He went away on his business. And he had business to do as a centurion. 8.14. Now we have a different scenario. And you see, Peter's still with Jesus, even after being insulted. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying down, ill with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and began to serve them. Now, this showed her great uh, authority orientation. Well, she had just been healed. Christ comes in. Immediately, she gets up and uh, starts to make dinner. Thank you, Lord. Let me do something for you. And that's the way it went. 8.16. When it was evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to him. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And then in 8.17, now there is a such a thing as demon possession. I've got that question before from a young person saying, are, are there really demons? Yes, there are, and they do possess people. You probably, and most people, never ever come in contact with it because we live in a nation with a preponderance of believers. And unbelievers are the only ones who are indwelled by demons. And in Africa, if you were to ever go there, you would probably see something that would resemble demon possession. They go into all kind of rituals trying to contact the spiritual world. It's part of their religion, satanic religion. And many of them do become demon possessed. And in the same way, since negative volition was prominent in Israel, there was a lot of demon possession going on. So wherever there is a preponderance of negative volition against the gospel, 
You see, it's against the God. You can have negative volition against gospel, which would send you to hell, or you can have negative volition against doctrine. The best thing, I mean, if you were positive toward the gospel and believed in Christ, that's good. You're going to heaven. Now the only thing you have to do is worry about your spiritual life. But if you're in your spiritual life and you are negative toward your spiritual life, it means punishment for you, but you're still going to heaven. You're still part of the royal family of God. So he would uh, cast out demons. And that indicates, as I was saying, that Israel was a place of a lot of demon activity. Uh, probably especially now that the Lord had come incarnate, the demons were probably going nuts, entering people like they had never entered people before. They wanted to be near the Lord. They wanted to trip him up just like everyone else wanted to trip up the Lord. 8.17, in this way, what Isaiah, the prophet, spoke was fulfilled. He himself whisked away our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now, this was a prophecy concerning the Messiah who would do these things. Now, there is no healing in atonement. When you believe in Christ and you have cancer, it doesn't mean that you'll be healed of cancer. You will believe in Christ and be saved and still have cancer. Now, if Jesus Christ wanted to perform a miracle and you have cancer, uh, then suddenly it might be removed, and it has happened before. It's happened where people have gone into prayer because they were about to die, and some people have prayed, don't take me yet because my children need me to guide them in doctrine. And they made that prayer, and then God has suddenly healed the cancer. And the doctor says, well, I don't know what happened, but uh, it's gone now. Lucky you. It's all the grace of God, a miracle. And it's not hard for God to perform miracles. But the one thing that he wants for us is the word of God. He wants for us so that when we are on our deathbed with cancer or something else, that we'll be able to handle it from the word of God. He wants us not to be carried into testing, but to carry our own doctrine into testing so that we can handle it. 8.18 Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go to the other side of the sea. You see, there's something that you must gain from this verse. And if you think about it, you might be able to come up with it. Well, there's great crowds around him. Look, what do most pastors want? Throngs of people all around them. Well, Jesus had that. Throngs of people all around him, far as the eye could see. And what does Jesus say? He gave orders to go to the other side of the sea. He's just going to leave them. Well, he has a mission, of course. Now, a, a local pastor doesn't just up and leave his congregation unless they ask him to. But uh, as, as far as Jesus, he had to go on and tell other people about his ministry. So there are religious people there, and they see these throngs of people like they've never seen before. And they say to themselves, my synagogue has never been filled this way. And so they look at Jesus and say, I could use this man. This man could really get me ahead. And there were people there like that. And Jesus Christ spotted them very quickly. So then a religious scribe came to him and said, I will follow you if you go. That's the corrected translation. I will follow you if you go. You see, he's saying if you go because he doesn't believe Jesus. He thinks Jesus is just like him. He thinks Jesus is concerned with numbers. And he sees all these people and he says, he goes up to Jesus, try to make an impression on Christ. And he says to Christ, hey man, I'll follow you if you go. He almost did it with a smirk on his face. Because he did not believe for one moment that Jesus Christ was about to leave such a huge throng of people. He just could not, he was scratching his head. And then he said, ah, oh, this guy's playing with their minds. I can use this fella, he's smart. He's telling them he's going to leave so that they'll pay more attention to him and he's not really going to leave. So he walks up to the Lord. I'll follow you if you go, Lord. But he knew. He knew, in his, he knew that Jesus wouldn't in his mind. He said, Jesus ain't going nowhere. He ain't going to leave these people. Well, there's too much money in their pockets. That's what he was thinking. This is the fox distraction which I've taught before. 
Then a religious scribe came to him and said, I will follow you if you go. Then in 820, you see Jesus comes back already knowing what this guy is. He sees him and says, this guy's a user. And that's what he said. And users are disgusting people. They think they can latch on to a ministry because, well, it's going to go great, great booms. And I'm not talking about anybody here. I've had others who have tried to latch on to it thinking something great would come of it or thinking they could get a free ride from it. No one here, people on the Internet. And they have thought they could latch on to this ministry. And, and, but as soon as they see that uh, nobody cares, are they here? No. They run home. No, I don't want... Nah, there's nothing there for me. Yeah, there's no money for you. There's no security for you that you think of as security. There's the Word of God. You see, their priorities are all wrong. Their eyes are on manna, money, not on the Word of God. Their eyes are on the crowds. And so was this man's eye on the crowd. Well, they say that there's no way Jesus is going to leave this crowd. Then Jesus makes a very neat point to this man. He's not so harsh with him because he's, he's probably an unbeliever and Jesus Christ knows he's going to hell. There's no hope for this fellow. He's just looking at money, cares not for the gospel. So Jesus said to him, Foxes have dens and all the birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, man, if you're looking for something from me, I'm homeless. I don't even have a home. I'm going across the sea. I don't have a home. I don't have anything. You're trying to latch on to me for the wrong reasons. And Jesus knew it. And that's why he said that. And as soon as he said, I don't have a place even to lay my head, that man, pachoom, gone. And once he saw he wasn't going to get anything out of this ministry of Christ, he said, bye-bye. And he walked away. And Jesus knew he would. And that's why Jesus said, look, you want money from me? You want to latch on to this ministry? I don't even have a house. I don't even have a place to lay my head. And I'm going across the sea anyway. And he did not follow the Lord. That's all found in the Greek. It's definitely the way it occurred. That's why th there would be no other reason why Jesus would say, look, I'm homeless. No other reason except to say, go away. You're a user. And he knew it. And he knew what to say to get him to go away. I'm homeless. I'm poorer than you are. But he wasn't, but he, was, he, he had a mission to go on. And he wasn't worried about those numbers. And he wasn't worried about money. He wasn't worried about anything. Of course not. He's the Lord. Worries a sin. 8.21 Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. Now this is, something, now this is harsh. This would about freak anyone out in the congregation. And, and here he is... Uh, He's in the middle of this crowd, and a disciple means student. We don't know which student came up to him and said, uh, Lord, I want to follow you, but permit me first to bury my father. And you would see that, you would think that any kind gentleman would say, Yes, I know you're going through a hard time. You can follow me as soon as you bury your father, and that'll be fine. And you might think that's the way Jesus would function, but Jesus didn't. He was tough, very tough, much tougher than I could ever be. So I would never probably suggest any such thing. Ah, don't worry about that funeral. Come to Bible class. No, I would never say that to anyone. But Jesus said it. He said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. You see, he is, there's nothing wrong with burying your father, of course. But what he, he's concerned with protocol. He's concerned with what people think. He is concerned with, if I don't show up for my father's funeral, everybody's going to think I'm a jackass. And protocol's fine to follow. And you go to funerals and all of that. But Jesus Christ is making a very concise point here by saying something. Now, don't go away from here thinking that I told you you can't go to your father's or mother's or whoever's funeral. That's asinine. I'm telling you what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is important. Now, I would go to my father and mother's funeral, but what, what, that's not the point. The point here, not that they're going to die soon or anything, 
They'll probably be a lot round longer than I am. No, they didn't laugh at that one. But anyway, what we have here is Jesus just making a point. And he's saying, uh, and this guy says, look, I got to go bury my dad. My dad just died. I want to follow you. I've heard what you've been saying, and I want to follow you. And he says, let me go bury my dad, and I'll come with you, because he's about to go across the sea. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. That's a command. He didn't just, he didn't, he didn't even, there's no concern here. You can say, where's this man's compassion? And everybody sitting there would look at this and say, where's that man's compassion? This poor guy, his dad just died. And the only thing he's cared about is himself. He's only concerned about himself. And he said, follow me. He said, my dad died. Follow me. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. That's what he told him. In other words, he's gone. You can't do anything about it. And the most important thing you can do is to keep going with the Word of God. That's your solace. That's where you receive comfort. Not in the protocol of life. Not in going to a funeral because everybody wants you to and you'll be a jackass if you don't. And they would look at them that way just as anyone around here would look at us. And if I ever made the suggestion, which I'm not making, that you should rather be at Bible class than at your father's funeral, if I ever made that suggestion, well, I would probably be booted out of here. But what happened here is the Lord is saying there's nothing more important than the Word of God. That's what he's saying. Nothing. I don't care if your father is dead. Nothing you can, there's nothing you can do about it. You might as well follow me. Follow me. And besides, why wouldn't you? He's the son of God. So, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. We studied that earlier last week. And remember we studied last week. And we have to go over it. Jesus Christ said, I did not come to bring, bring peace. But I have come to bring a sword. I will divide mother against daughter, father against son, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, father-in-law against son-in-law. This is the words of our Lord. He didn't come to bring peace. And this is actually a reference to this. There are two systems. There's the spiritual life, and then there is the cosmic system. The cosmic system hates the spiritual life. Hates it. Now, when you're in the spiritual life, you don't have hatred. You just live it on your own and expect the punches will come along and take them in your spiritual life. Now, there are actually two categories, spiritual life and divine establishment. That's because an unbeliever can function under divine establishment and be under uh, what is called uh, the uh, divine dynosphere, not the divine dynosphere, but under the divine establishment, he can be functioning outside of the cosmic system because he's functioning under divine establishment, which means he loves his family and he loves his wife, he loves his job, he loves his country, so uh, he is outside of the cosmic system. That's the only way an unbeliever can be. But an unbeliever who has rejected Christ immediately goes into the cosmic system. Once you reject Christ, unbeliever, you go into the cosmic system. And when you're there, you will always have a tendency to attack the believer. Why do you think the President of the United States is attacked so much today? I mean, just irregardless of anything, just vitriolic hate toward a man who is a wonderful president. And he, he doesn't do some of the things I would like him to, but uh, who am I? I'm not president. He got there, and he's in a war, and he's fighting it, doing the best he can. Why do you think he's so hated? Because he's a believer. 49% of the people, well, 47.5%, 48% about, of the people ran out and voted against George Bush mainly because he's a Christian. Well, the unbelievers had heard the gospel, especially being in this country. They've heard it somewhere. Even if it was a bit confused, God, the Holy Spirit, can, can still reveal it to them. So they're in the cosmic system. Unbelievers who have rejected the gospel. 
And so here's President Bush, a believer, and he makes no qualms about it, gets up and says, uh, I believed in Christ, Jesus Christ is right, my role model, etc., etc. And he quotes Bible verses all the time. The cosmic system hates that. He's one of the most hated presidents we've ever had. Not by a majority, but I'm talking about the vitriol is so strong, it has to come from the cosmic system. They don't even remember 9-11. They don't remember anything that has happened to this country and how much he's done to try to protect us, humanly speaking. So that is cosmic system. Now the believer who neglects, you see, neglect of Bible doctrine and rejection of Bible doctrine are closely related, both of which will take you into the cosmic system. Neglect of Bible doctrine is cosmic number one. You neglect it, you got something more important to do. Well, you're neglecting it. It's tantamount to rejection. Now, as I've told you, I don't know if you listen on MP3 or not. It's not my business, but it is my business to make sure that you understand you have to get it every day. You have to. Whether you're here or not, whether you listen on MP3, it's important you get it every day. Otherwise, you'll fall into the cosmic system. And when you get into the cosmic system, there are two categories for the believer. One, neglect the Word of God. That's cosmic one. And you don't necessarily hate the communication of doctrine. Uh, you just uh, don't have time for it. Then there's cosmic two. You hate it. You're going to find any little thing you can nitpick at to destroy the communication of doctrine. That means you're in cosmic two. And I didn't make all of this up. This is all in Scripture. It's all in Matthew. It's all uh, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I come with a sword. I will divide families, not pull them together. We all have the wrong impression about our Lord. We must, uh, somebody must think he, he must have been like a, a sweet little angel and very kind. But we can see from this verse he, he really didn't give a damn, did he? I mean, you can see, my father's died. I'm, I'm ready to follow you, Lord. I'm coming. I'm going to follow you across the sea. But that something horrible happened. My father died, and I'm going to have to go to the funeral. I'll, I'll catch up with you. And then Christ looks at him. Follow me! Let the dead bury their own dead. You can't do anything about it anyway. It's time that you get serious with the Word of God, brother or son in that case, since he is the son of God. So this man failed. This man failed because he had an excuse. And he did not go with the Lord. Now the Lord didn't grab him and say, you're coming with me whether you want to or not. No, he just told him a principle. He said, follow me. And then when he didn't, well, Jesus went across the sea. He had, he, had a, he had a job to do. He couldn't wait around. And he, if Jesus would have been concerned about what people thought of him, he would have never went to the cross because nobody would have ever gotten angry with him. So now we have the faith rest testing of the disciples, and we'll continue that some other time. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and may we come to know the importance of the Word of God that it is number one and nothing else should ever, ever come in front of the Word of God. Let us come to realize that it is our prerogative and it is our mandate from Scripture to grow in grace and in knowledge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.